Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury, New Hampshire. I've got a throwback evening for you tonight. We're going to delve into the world of hand chopped mortises and cut hands on tenons. Uh, one of the mortiser, after you've cut some by hand, is one of the most valuable <laughs> tools you can have. And any power or method to cut your mortises, um, it's a concealed joint for the most part, except when they're through tenons. So in the world of fine furniture making, it's never been a rule that they have to be hand cut. However, dovetails, those are exposed and there's something about the world of fine furniture, uh, at least with the, the furniture masters of New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Furniture Masters, that I've been a part of for quite a while. You would just don't, it's a no-no to have anything but hand-cut dovetails because that's an exposed joint. It's kind of the signature of quality and it just, that's the way it is. So that's the way I always do them. Now, um, there's a lot of machine methods to cut mortises. There's, as I mentioned, the hall chisel mortiser. You can set up a plunge router. There's chain machines. And then there's the multi-router, which is a powered, uh, like a router. Well, it's a router, but you have these moving axes to uh, cut the, the mortises. And it's just fantastic. Cut makes fast, you know, just rapid, repeatable, accurate joinery. But there's times when you have an unusual situation where it's a challenge to, you know, reference off of a flat surface or whatnot and cut a mortise or a tenon. And I've run into that particularly when I've been making chairs. Um, I know the top of the legs of the Queen Anne curved legs at times uh, working with those types of elements I had to just mark the location and cut them by hand and that's pretty crazy because you've got a lot of time invested in there but you know it's the most direct and practical method so it's good to know how to do it so I do want to share that with you tonight uh, if nothing else it just convinces you to buy a mortiser. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let me show you what I got here. I've got this, uh, this is what a hollow chisel bit looks like, for those of you who haven't seen that. As a, it, it's basically a chisel, a four-sided chisel of a certain dimension. This one happens to be 5 16 square. And when you buy them, they come in increments, usually a quarter, five sixteenths, three eighths, and a half. And inside that hollow chisel spins a regular drill bit, but a drill bit that you can see has these exceedingly, <laughs> exceedingly, exceptional <laughs> deep gullets to remove the chips so that when this is spinning inside said hollow chisel, you want the drill bit protruding about a sixteenth of an inch from the points on the hollow chisel so that as the chisel spins, the chips are cut and evacuated out this hole. This is what I typically use and you can set the depth on this and one plunge to that set depth and you get a rectangular, well, you get a, one cut and then you're moving along in that angle. It's, it's braced against a fence and it literally takes you, what does it take, like 30 seconds to cut a mortise like that about, right? Just move right across and then you've got to clean out the bottom a little. So this is a 3 8 mortise. But if you don't have a mortise machine or you don't want to set up the router and you're not in the market for multi-router, then you're gonna cut them by hand. So instead of the hollow chisel mortise, when you're gonna cut them by hand, you need a mortising chisel. So here's the typical leg. This is actually the same size leg. And at the top, I'd have to decide where I want it to be my face side. And this looks good, and this looks good. The angle's kind of flowing with a tapered leg if I was gonna put a tapered leg. 
So I'm going to have a mortise positioned right about there and then one right there. I've already got a little scribble there. Okay, so that's my location roughly. Now I'm going to take, this is going to be my rail. This rail is going to be set into that leg and I'm going to offset it about 3 30 seconds of an inch. You can go flush, but especially when you cut them by hand, it's a little easier if you offset them because then you don't have to worry about uh, everything being perfect because there's a little more uh, humanness <laughs> to the cuts when you're doing them by hand, okay? And that's a good thing. So this here we, we have, I think this is two and three quarters, it doesn't really matter, but you can mark this out a lot of ways. You can take a square and set it on a flat surface this way and just bring this down and lock that square in. And now this square is flush, dead flush with that width. So I could come in here and make a pencil mark, right? But I'm gonna, I want a little more accuracy than a pencil mark. I kind of want a knife line. So I can easily set up a marking gauge which has a slicing cut. This is actually like a slicing kind of gauge. It has the knife in there instead of the pin. And I just set that, look, to be exactly the width of my rail. Okay, so it just touches the edge right there. Okay, so that's the width of my rail. I would just have to lock that in and then I could go to each of my legs and I'm going to reference off the top of the leg and make a nice little scribe, just like that. And I'll go right where the other scribble is and make another little scribe on that side, okay? Now the, the step down, I'm going to, I don't want to run my mortise all the way out the leg or else it won't be strong at all, but I'm going to leave some material at the top. I usually leave about five eighths of an inch for strength. And I've already, I've got this square set up at 5 eighths. Up here, I'm just going to make a pencil mark because it's interior to the joint, not super critical. And I'll just go ahead and mark that. Okay, so that's where we want our mortise locations. Now, this would be all you'd have to do if you were cutting in the hollow chisel because you'd set the fence and the chisel would come down and cut it. But we have to mark the width of our channel that we're going to cut here. So for that, you want to use the classic double pin marking gauge. And this is one that's special to me. Pug Moore gave this to me as a gift. Um, and I keep it special, but I don't actually use it a lot. And this one has a double pin on one side. So it's got those round pins and you can adjust those in and out, they slide, and you want to adjust them exactly to the width of your chisel, okay? Now, I'm not going to use this one because I haven't honed those pins. Usually when I'm going to use a um, mortiser like this, I mean a marking gauge, I will file those pins into knife edges. I prefer the slicing cut than the dragging cut, so that's actually what I did on this one. This is my, this is one I picked up at a flea market uh, when we were in North Carolina. It was a beautiful rosewood and brass and it has the same kind of thing except you turn this handle and it's got a double pin right here. And that double pin I did sharpen. I kind of filed it. I don't know if you can see it. They're so short, but I did. And I set those two peaks right to the edge of the mortising chisel and I've got my width. Now this mortising chisel performs just really like the hollow chisel. It goes in as you drive it in, the width of the chisel is going to define the width of the mortise. So you don't, you'll see when we start cutting it, but we're going to position the chisel and stay in this orientation the whole time because this is a 5 16 mortising chisel. It's 5 16 on this width. I have an old mortising chisel here that I picked up at another flea market. And look at that. 
it's kind of a skew a little bit, but look, a, a mortising chisel usually is heavy in this dimension because it's going to be used to pry um, as almost like a lever. Then, it, and you've got like this heavier angle down here. So this mortising chisel, when I got them, this angle is sharpened to about 30 degrees. So it'll hold an edge a little longer. It's taking a lot of abuse. You're driving it down uh, into the material and then prying with it. Uh, so you want it to hold that edge longer. So a 30 degree will work better. And anyway, this, this old mortising chisel is defined, the, the mortise it will cut is defined by measuring across here. And that steel is, we'll call it a quarter inch, just a touch over, but it is, this would be considered a quarter inch. So it doesn't really matter what it is because you're going to just set your points on your tool exactly to the width of that chisel and then you're going to transfer that to the work and you're also going to use the same set for your tenon. When you cut the tenons, you're going to use the same setup. So, so I've got a question from Nathan and Tom. Sure. Why don't you bring in the mortise on the bottom of the rail mark to leave about one-eighth to one-quarter inch between the mortise and bottom of the rail? Does this look better? That's a great question. That, that it would potentially look better because it's, there's no risk for seeing the mortise if you step it in. However, it's common, very common, traditionally and uh, lately, <laughs> to set the bottom of the mortise to the bottom of the rail. It's just a way more convenient reference point for setting up the rail. Think about it, if you offset the mortise inside, then you have to offset the tenon as well. So you're adding a step. You're going to have to cut a separate shoulder at the bottom there. And you want it to rest on that. It gives you a reference point to rest on the bottom of the mortise, the rail anyway. So on tables, chairs, wherever the rail is low, and you're not hardly ever going to look under there anyway, the mortise and tenons were always aligned with the bottom of the rail so that there's no fussing. Because if what if you cut that shoulder a little too far in? Then it's not resting, it's kind of floating, and you lose it when you offset it up and in. But you're, you're right, it would take away the risk of seeing it. Uh, there are times when we make the tables where there's a tiny little gap there, and I say, you know, that's actually the sh telltale sign of fine craftsmanship because <laughs> you can see that it's a true mortise and tenon and there's no sneaky uh, dowels or biscuits in there. No, no shame on dowels and biscuits, but the mortise and tenon is better. So let's start marking out. We've got our double pin marking gauge set to the width of our chisel and now we can come on over to the mortise location and I'm I set, then I had to set the, the beam off of the fence to give me the offset of that mortise. And I just went with 3 eighths of an inch to the inside pin, okay? So it's 3 eighths of an inch to that first pin, and then you go over 5 sixteenths to the second pin. So I'm just going to turn, and this is my fence. That goes against the face of the workpiece, and I'm going to drag that across. Okay, I'll do it, I'll pronounce it so you can really see. You see those? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's my 5 16 Then I'll go to the other side. You know, this is, because this is handwork, I don't even have a problem. If I slipped a little and went forward and made a couple little lines, I kind of enjoy seeing that, you know, because if you're going to go through the trouble of doing this by hand, why not let people see that it was made by hand? <laughs> all right, so once I've got them all marked out like that, I do this for all, all the legs. I'm going to set this on the bench, and I want to try to position this over, over a leg, like my leg is right there, out on the ends 
you get more of a bounce over the leg. It's pretty stout. So I'm going to settle it right in here. You just want to clamp it to the bench nice and strong here. I don't want it moving around on us. Move this up a little bit. Okay. Now we've got our chisel and we're ready to go. So I, I like to do it in a way that I am standing with the, the top of the leg away from me. And I'm going to start with the flat side of the chisel toward me and a, up off of that bottom line by, you know, at least a quarter, maybe three eighths. You could go a half an inch. This is just to start the cut. Now, one of the nice things about a morsing chisel is that the handle has kind of a flat on it. See that? That helps you align it when you're holding it. But when I start off, it's hard to position that, you know, with that long distance to get it like you're, you're holding it up here and you're moving it around to get it where you want it. So you can hold it lower to start off if you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hold it up higher so you can see better because my fingers will cover up what I'm doing. But let's just do it. Either way will work fine. Okay, so I'm right between the lines. And I'll just go straight down. Now I'm going to come out and go forward a little bit. And look, I'm going to roll it, kind of rock it away from me. And I just start to create the channel between those two guidelines. And I'm just trying to, don't go crazy, just take light kind of cuts, like about an eighth of an inch or, or even less if you want. The chips will just come right up. And I'm always keeping things aligned and I'm prying the chisel away from me like that. So it, it, the width of the chisel just makes a beautiful, consistent Got some channel. questions coming up. You want to feel them? Um, yeah, let me first go get it going a little more. Okay. So once, once you've got that initial channel, that's nice because now you don't have to position as much. You're just going to keep following that. And I'm standing here and I'm, I'm just naturally positioning myself and sighting the chisel plumb with the bench. So I always want to keep that position as I'm rocking. I don't want my mortars going off at an angle like that to the side. I'm going straight and I'm keeping it plumb in the other dimension. All right, so I go across one time. Now I can come a little closer to the bottom. Just come in about an eighth of an inch closer. And now I'll do the same thing. Everything's just a little lower. Same kind of chipping method. Not too, trying to get too much. Okay, I could take a question now while I'm doing this. Okay, so any I, thoughts on using gonna, a hold down? Don't be rude. Uh, sure, hold down, whatever you want. I hold fast. Yeah, those are great. I got these holes here, but whatever you want to hold it down with. You just got to get it. Obviously, you don't want it sliding around. Do you ever put a small clamp across the area the mortise is going into to reinforce the edges of the uh, keep them from splitting? The, oh, the sides here? I guess that would be the question. Uh, not necessary, um, because you're removing the chisel, you're removing the material. There's no like pressure outward like that. The pressure is along the length, and, I, and I'm not going to harm that. So I can turn it around. See, so I can put the bevel toward me here. I'm not quite to the line yet, so you've got to be careful not to pry on your bottom edge where you're going to be exposed. You can pry up here because it's, it's going to be buried by the rail. But if you want to get some of those chips out, you can just so, um, go no on scoring in. of the mortise sides is necessary. Is it not needed because it's hidden in the joint? I'm not going to put a chisel in. If that's if what you mean is put a chisel in this way and keep scoring down, I don't want to do that. All I need are those scribe lines on the top, and then once I get below grade here, that's the morticing chisel takes over, and it becomes an alignment tool. 
and a beautiful tool to, let's keep going, to remove the chips. in a clean way. So I'm just going to keep prying this way and walking it away from me. Um, I have a gen general question, like when would you use a haunch mortise and tenon? Oh, um, you could do a haunch here. I've seen people do that, but I typically don't use haunches on tables and chair legs. They weren't usually used. Where the haunches were mostly used um, were with frame and panel. We showed that. We did do a frame and panel one night uh, where we, we put a haunch in because you have to run a groove for the panel to be set. And then the frame, you're going to have your corners mortised. And so the haunch it's just a continuation of the groove that runs all the way. I don't know if I can explain that well enough, but um, that's the only time I've, I really find a need for a haunch. I, I did have a haunch, someone's going to ask me that. Uh, Rick says, I think I know why, but why do you start a one quarter to three eighths of an inch away from the line? Oh, just so I can, I just keep walking each time I move like a quarter inch, I'm going a little deeper. So I start off here and um, I'm working toward it. So it's just a, a way of, as I go deeper, I get closer and closer to the line. It's no, nothing sophisticated about it. So I'm gonna go about the depth right on this one that I would meet the mortise coming in from the other side and that's, about three quarters of an inch. But I'm just about there. So at this point here, I'm going to make the money cut and set the chisel into that knife line that I made earlier. And this is where having the knife line is a little bit nicer than just a pencil line because I can set the chisel right in it. Hold it nice and plumb and drive your chisel straight down. Now you got it. How do you maintain the chisel 90 degrees left? right as you go deeper into the mortise? Um, you have to be a master. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you actually will get a feel for it. My head is in alignment with the rail. So I'm seeing this chisel and I'm just holding it true vertical. I mean, obviously it's an eyeball, but that's all you need. You don't have to, you don't need it to be uh, that's, that's the way you do it. You don't, you don't, it's by hand. So there's no, nothing other than that. But you'd be surprised. I think if you try one, um, you gotta just practice a little bit. This is cherry. Again, um, I always say, try it out, start out on white pine or even poplar or something that's a little more agreeable. Pine, you know, is a little squishy, so it wouldn't be, but it would definitely chop a lot easier. How about the weight of the mallet, Tom? What is that? 20 ounce, and this happens to be a wood is good mallet. This is the old kind when they, I think they're green now. All right, so I think I'm about the full depth there, or at least. How do you determine that? Did you I mean, I'm, I'm going to show, I eyeballed okay. that too. Okay. So I can see how deep the chisel was going. I made like three or four passes. So if I measure in, see how I'm three quarters of an inch deep? Mm -hmm. Three quarters. So that, if I look over here, when I'm just about to that mortise, I don't want to go all the way. Or when I'm, when I'm chopping this one, I'm going to break into that void space. So I want to stop right about there. Just go a little into it. Now when I chop this one, I'm going to go the full depth and I'll just clean out where they meet down in there. Okay, so here this time, one more time we'll do this and you'll get to see the... the Have you ever tried drilling out the center of the mortise with a drill bit and then using a regular... Yes, you can do that as well. That's another method I'm not gonna show tonight, but the thing about that is um, it, the mortising chisel actually works best 
without all that being removed in the middle uh, because it's nicely supported. You're, once you do that, you're tempted, and I know you end up coming in here with a chisel vertically like this and paring down the sidewalls. That's where things can go sideways on you because it's harder to pare dead plum and actually get the other side aligned with it after you go there. But um, yeah, you can definitely try it. You can pre-drill and then try the mortising chisel. You, know, you might have good success with it. I, I just hadn't tried that in a long time. We used to, um, I've always used mortising. I know Pug before, before they had their mortising machine, that's how they, they would drill them out. And I don't, I don't know. I, I wasn't around for, and I never asked him. Okay, so here's the initial one again. I'm just Did you clamp a straight edge bar parallel to your cuts to register the chisel? Yeah. On the lines? Yeah, you can do whatever you want like that, but I, um, I think you, you lose a little of the freedom that way. It's almost like, I don't know. No, I, <laughs> it, you can do that. You just are going to slow yourself down a little by trying to align something that really isn't necessary because of the nature of this. This is not a perfect science. It's not like you're, you're routing a perfectly smooth sidewall. It's, it's hand cut. So there's some variation here. But if you are careful on that first pass, it's amazing how you can sight this. And then as you pry it, you're, you're truing up the channel as you go. Nice and plumb. Any thoughts on the Japanese and American mortise, the differences? And do you know much about that? I don't know a lot about the Japanese. I've seen a lot of those joints, and it's quite... They're probably, they're probably the, <laughs> the masters when it comes to uh, creativity and complexity, just sophistication when it comes to joinery, um, all kinds of like mechanical corners where you have three legs meet and they're, they almost don't need glue, you know? because they're assembled mechanically, so beautifully done, almost, you know, and it, they were used that joinery and timber framing as well. But let's see, I'm getting closer. See, I'm gonna start from that side, from over there, you'd be able to see in through the other mortise. Did, did Pug have a mortiser by the time you got to... to yeah, do? yeah. So you didn't have to do hand motors? No, we... Uh, it was a... Um, oh, shoot, what was the name of that? A Walker Turner. <laughs> we had a Walker Turner. And he had a Walker Turner 16-inch uh, uh, bandsaw as well. I like those Walker Turner tools. So now I'm gonna I'm on the knife line again. Okay. All right. So Are now I'm gonna turn it to around. to take deeper cuts. Yeah, I think as you get used to it, you get to know like what's the optimal depth for speed, without sacrificing accuracy and nice work. You know, because that's, that's true of any hand skill that I do. You know, you you realize that at first you realize, oh, I, I'm, I'm being too careful. But you're just learning the tolerances of what everything is. So it's part of the process to go slow, take lighter bites. You're, you're kind of developing uh, muscle memory and sensitivity to the textures, everything, how to hold the tool. There's so much going on that you're learning as you make your first one. So never get discouraged the first time because it's a, it's a process where you're learning. So let me 
Now I'm going to bring this in, just, just going to connect that at the very bottom because I tried not to go quite all the way to, I didn't want to lose, I didn't want to overdo it in one dimension, you know, so that I would get, okay, so that's all I do is I just come in at the end, but there you go, doesn't that look pretty decent, right, for hand cut mortise, so that's all there is to it. Um, of course, like I said, you can do them different sizes, mark them out, and you're going to work a process very similar to that. All right, so once I have that, I'm going to just, this is a little faster process to make the tenons. Um, we're going to hand cut the tenons on this little guy, <laughs> right? So this is going to go in this way. Now, I'm going to, like I said, offset it slightly. Um, usually I have like a 3.30 second offset because 1 16th isn't quite enough and 1 8th is too much. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take my um, rule. I'm going to move my fence. So I'm going to move those points 3.30 seconds closer to the fence. And that's going to, because now I'm going to mark, I'm not going to change the, the distance the pins are apart, but I'm going to go from 3 eighths down to 9.30 seconds. Okay, that's about it right there. Double check. That looks good. So I'm going to lock that in. And now I can mark my rails here. You could square, you could mark the distance or the length of your tenons, which here will, will be seven eighths of an inch. So I could come in here and mark seven eighths of an inch and then take my square and square all around. Okay, you can make a square line all around, which you would have to do if your ends were not square. Uh, my ends are square in this case, so you can use the ends as a reference and I've got this slicing marking gauge set right at seven eighths. So I'm going to just use that to score right around the end. And this is going to show me where I want to be. Okay. So this is the shoulder of my tenon. And I'll just go right around like this. Marking gauge is such a nice tool to help you rapidly and accurately mark because it's the built-in fence and the knife in one. Um, anyway, once I got that, now I'll just make a little score cut across the top and bottom. Bottom's not really necessary, but let's just do it anyway. That'll show us the depth. And there we go. So we've got all those lines cut there. And now I'm going to use the double pin to mark the width of the tenant. So I already put a chalk marker in here. That just means the face and the up. So that being the face, I'll put it into my vise. I want to make sure I put the fence referencing off the face for the way I move those pins. And I'm going to just drag that. See how I'm holding it? I'm getting my pin lines there, and then I'll drag it across here. Make some nice score lines. That's going to be what I use to sight it, to saw it. And then I'll come up. Okay. Just rotate. Same thing on the I'm other side. This, this is all cherry. Just had some nice pieces around. Isn't a general question about how you feel about the marble chisel compared to the more modern steel chisels? Uh, the chisels vary so much based on the quality of the steel, the prices and all that. Um, those happen to be marbles, uh, mortising chisels. And I can't remember where I got them. I think I back then I, I may have got them from... Highland Woodworking down in um, Atlanta. Some of you will know that place. Pretty good tool place. Uh, but I'm all marked out. I'm ready to cut my joints. I'll just cut the tenons first. 
and then we'll cut our shoulders. So while we're right here, I'm going to put it into the vise. I gotta hold it upright somehow. And I'm just gonna use, this is not classically a tannining saw. It's, it looks a lot like one, but it actually has a cross-cut configured tooth pattern. It's a four points per inch cross-cut, and it's fine. I don't, I don't cut enough tenons like this to warrant even buying a tenoning saw. So, but this will cut pretty well, but it's not configured with a rip tooth, so it's not optimal. If you're gonna do a lot of this, get yourself a nice tenoning saw because you're gonna have a rip configured tooth there where much the same as a dovetail saw is. All right, so once I, what I'm gonna do is start, you may see some people teach that you turn it this way and you're gonna cut into this corner on the line, and then you'll turn it around the other, lean it that way and cut up there, and then you connect the lines. That for really wide stock, that might be a decent method. I just prefer, with a piece this wide, I just feel better about going one sweeping cut. But I start on the corner away from me, and I'm going to hold it down, and I'm getting my thumb on the, I'm, watch, I'll show you in a second. I'm cutting on the waist side of the line, but I want the saw to just touch the line, okay? So I'm gonna bring it back and then get it started. Nice and light. And I'm just progressing nicely. Now I'm gonna let the saw lower and track right across the top of my knife line. And I'd rather miss outside because I can easily trim that tenon up. I'll show you after. Okay, now I'll do the other side. John's curious when and why are there different types of tenons? Tusks, pegged, wedged through, mitered face, bridle joint, and crenelated? Yeah, um, all of those types of tenons have to do with the situation. So they have their advantages construction-wise, like mechanically, what are you asking the tenon to do? So if you're gonna have a disassembling uh, trestle table, you're automatically thinking tusk tenon comes through, you got your wedge in there, and it looks cool, it's classic, big through tenon with a wedge going through it. Um, you know, it's just every joint has its place. The classic right angle joint with the mortise and tenon is like this. So it's where you have a corner come in, so you're gonna have it offset like that. Um, in other classes, we've talked about the value of a twin tenon, how exceptional, exceptionally strong that is and advantageous for thinner material coming into a leg. But uh, yeah, we talk about that all the time, usually specifically related to the build we're making and why we're using that joint. That's, that's a great question and kind of a expansive one. Tom, is there an advantage to Frank Claus's bow saw? His bow saw is like really taut, it's light, helps you align, it's a wonderful saw. It's a, it's a different type of you know, European way of sawing. And I believe when he was gonna cut tenons like this, it's like five teeth per inch. So it's super nice and aggressive. And that's what you want really when you're cutting a lot of material, you're, you're ripping. So a lot of fiber has to get carried away by the depth of the gullets. So that's our classic rip tooth. And to have fewer teeth per inch, optimal. I love that guy, he's, he's a class act. <laughs> In fact, if you wanna watch a great, if you're a member of Fine Woodworking, do a search for Frank Klaus and Mortises and you'll see a video that I watched in the late 80s. And that's how I learned how to hand cut mortises like this. And 
Pretty cool. He's a he's a great guy. Okay. So if the tenon is an inch or so long, why not use a dovetail saw? Um, it's a little finer tooth than this one, and this has more heft to it. I just I like the alignment I feel with this. It's got the body of a larger tenoning saw, like Lee Nielsen, I believe, makes a tenoning saw. Um, so I think it's a little wider, has weight, but it would have a more aggressive uh, rip tooth configuration. All right, so now I'm going to go to the other side of the knife line, pull it back to me. This is the last one of this. We're almost there. <laughs> Just let it touch and drop it in. Tom, what do you think about, what do you have to think about with wood movement, expansion and contraction in a tenon over time? Uh, really no problem with a tenon this, this narrow. With really wide ones, yeah, you got to think about that. But this is, this is so small, not a big deal. But yeah, if, if you have a wide panel, you know, you would break them up and you have to be careful about cross grain glue ups like that or you would have your panel cracking. The last thing we have to do is cut our shoulders. I could do this just by holding it. I've got a little bench hook I'm going to show you in a second and just sawing across as best I could to that line. But it's tricky. It's because you're trying to drop that in over a wider piece and the saw could get a little ragged. You can do it and learn that way. It's, it's fine, but that's really freehand. I want to show you a little secondary step that will give you really nice crisp shoulders and success the first time around. And that's to make a tiny little relief cut on there. So to do that, I just bring in my square and a marking knife. So I'm going to cut this, this knife line a little bit deeper, okay? Just going to hold my marking knife here and score it a little more forcefully. Nice plumb line there, okay? Same thing on the other side. These are nice and parallel. Okay, now we flip it around. Same thing again. Okay, and then flip. So by doing this, you're going to give yourself a place for the saw to start. And just like Tony's question, you're going to help yourself because you're going to make a little groove that the saw will want to drop into and it will give you better results. So let's just, I'll show you. I'm just going to clamp this here, this little piece. You can go right here. And then I'll take, um, let's use a one inch chisel. So now that I've got that knife cut, I'm just going to make a little relief cut here. Just angle the one inch chisel downward and just make this little kind of angular cut, and when it hits that knife line, the chip will want to release. Okay, so then you get those chips out of there. And what you've got is a nice clean shoulder now. See that? That's, this is actually what you see when you create the joint. That's the shoulder line. When that pulls up to the leg, that edge is critical. So you've already established it this way. If you're going to cut them by hand, you know, when you're doing it on the table saw, the cross cut on the table saw makes a nice clean scoring cut. So you don't worry about it, but just doing this additional step, if you're working by hand, does give you a little cleaner result. But if you want to go for it without this method, by all means, I mean, you could just make lines. I know I, in that video, um, I don't know if they have the whole video, but I know when Frank Klaus cut the tenons, he, he just went for it, you know, <laughs> just had the pencils and his big bow saw and nice alignment, made nice cuts. 
uh, they weren't perfect, but they weren't, you know, to do really fine work, you, you have to, you would make those cuts, and then you would, more often than not, you would come back with a shoulder plane. That's what they were for, to clean up shoulders like this. But by doing this, you don't have to really use the shoulder plane much at all. We'll see why in a second. Okay. That's good. And last one. Imagine if we're making a whole table here. <laughs> This is a nice little respite, though, to get away from machine work. And that's the nice thing. If the power goes out, you're still in business. <laughs> you're not making any money, but you're in business. Okay. So, all right, so that's good. Now, I'm going to show you my little bench hook. I use this for hand sawing. It's just a block with a uh, cleat that goes into my bench. It gets, it gets everything up off the table so I can saw more comfortably. And it holds it against that fence that's nice and square. So I'm gonna hold it here. So, well look at this. This comes right in and it leans against that shoulder. So I wanna start gently. my tenon off. I may not be quite deep enough there. Okay, on the other side. one here we go see how much easier it is just to, you can start it and track it beautifully without stressing it almost feels like it's in one of those old miter boxes you know that had this type of saw those old standings because you're you're guided by it it's right there Okay, now I'm going to get my step down, which I know is, I want to be a little over 5 eighths to step down from the top. So I'll just come in here. Okay, that's the top. Now I can move this. And I'm just going to put this back in the vise. And I'm going to make a straight kind of... This is just to cut, to notch the top of this tenon. Okay, now I'm going to get back my bench hook. And let's make, we'll just use the Japanese saw to cut this top. Just set it right against the shoulder. Okay, now we gotta do just a little cleanup with a chisel. So, where's my three quarter? I just want to make sure that all this in here 
right at the base of that cut where it didn't quite go deep enough. You got to remove that or else you may have some, it won't allow the, the tenon to sit all the way. Okay, and then I'm going to pair the top of this has to come in and quite get deep enough there. Everything has to be in plane with that shoulder. Looking good, I would say. And the other side, same thing. Looks pretty clean. And hit the top. All right, so let's just make sure I got all that out of there. All right, so we're gonna just bring it into this mortise here. This one feels a little fat. It's nice at the top, but I could feel it fat here. So see that, I can see my line. Can you see that? There's a knife line right there. So that's good because I'm off it, I can see that. So this is where you're gonna just take your shoulder plane. This is actually for the, not the shoulder, but on the actual cheek of the tenon. Just a few little swipes here. And give it a try, don't overdo it. For, okay, feels like a little more. I may just hit, just tweak the other side first. I don't do tenons enough to nail these every time. But there you go. That feels a, still a little snug on the bottom. Let me just do a little more. Have you ever thought about cutting the corners on the tenons to make it a little easier? Oh, fit? like this? Yeah, you can, you can trim the front edge like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's a good idea. But then it's the main sidewall that makes the difference and now we've got it so let's check it out look how nice see how nice and tight that is on the inside and you can just see the cut at the bottom there and then the other side let's see if it fits in this will That one's a little closer, but it does need a little, could be the mortise is slightly off, but I'd rather be a little heavy like this. Cause you see how little it takes to get it right. And the knife line on the tenon tells you which one it is, which way to go. Touch more. You know what it is? I didn't, I didn't bevel the lead of my tenon. Here I was thinking we were gonna be done early and we're gonna have time for lots of questions. See our nice little offset? It's snug on the inside and the outside. Now, you know what I did a couple others before you came? Look at these, I got these little pieces and I chamfered the inside and I've got some other legs. Let's make the smallest table I've ever made. <laughs> I'm gonna have to take off those inside corners. So, and I, I'm not sure if they all fit everywhere. I think they will though, it should be pretty easy. Um, you can just take a block plane or you can go to the bandsaw, but I'm gonna just hold it at about a 45. And just create a quick chamfer like that. All right, so let's see if this works. 
Hopefully these will all fit. Okay, and then let's see if we can do this. <laughs> these are all hand cut. The exact same way. I gotta taper these legs. I think this will make a nice little uh, what they would call a whiskey table. <laughs> That's what they used to call them. Little tables like this. We have no need for that though. You should raffle it off. Yeah, so this could get glued up, all those shoulders up nicely. And you would have the cutest little <laughs> nothing table. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I'll put some little tapers on there, little top. This would actually be nice by a lower chair because when you reach over, you don't want a, the 24-inch height, typical chair. This is sort of that... With a top on this, it would be about 13 and a half. So, I don't know, you guys, what do you think? What would you use this for? <laughs> Side table for the footstool, Joel says. Yeah, there you go. But yeah. see, you could knock out a table like this by hand. If you want to practice hand cut mortise and tenons, it wouldn't be hard to make a table like this and you could do it with um, pine or something, you could paint it or use a hardwood. Well, that was fun, actually. I enjoy just going down, not turning on the machines for a change one night, and just having some fun with some hand tools. Hey, if you enjoy this content, please uh, like, share, and subscribe, and head on over to epicwoodworking.com where you can find out more about everything we got going on there. We've got courses and, and the neighborhood. If you Use join spots. the mailing list, you're, you're going to get all the announcements as soon as we have them. Thank you so much once again for hanging out in the shop with us. I had a great time. I hope you did. Mm -hmm. Look forward to seeing you next time.